All right, I am Peter Abiel from UC Berkeley, and I will tell you a little bit about our work on learning to perform robotic manipulation tasks. So, in fact, there's a few different things going on in my group right now. Um, I'm gonna tell you about the last two here, which are learning from demonstrations and reinforcement learning. So let's start with the learning from demonstrations. The idea here is that, for example, you'd want the robot to learn to tie a knot in a rope. You start out with a rope laid out in front of you on the table. You tie a knot while the robot watches. Then you lay out the rope again in front of the robot, but in a different configuration. And you want the robot to understand what motions are now the right motions to succeed at tying a knot for this new configuration. So just mimicking the motions that were just observed is not going to succeed because the rope is in a different state. Okay, so the way we've been looking at this problem is um, by looking at the medical imaging literature and really what we've been looking at is how to register scenes onto each other. So as a starting point, let's assume we take a point cloud of a training scene as you could get from a Kinect. Um, let's say this is the trajectory demonstration for that point cloud. It's four points here, but in general, maybe thousands of points. It's just a cartoon image. Then you're faced with a test scene, and the question is, what's now the right trajectory to perform in the test scene? Most of us understand that it's looping around the bottom left, that's part of it, otherwise you're not really generalizing what you saw, but the question is, how do you get an algorithm that actually does that for you? Okay? So, we looked at the registration literature, and what that tells you is, it gives you algorithms to register scenes onto each other. So what we do first is we register train onto test scene, and then here's the novel part, which is we look at how to generalize this registration to the entire 3D space. So say these are just four samples of a function from R3 to R3. Let's learn the entire function. Once we learn the entire function, we can now apply that function to the trajectory, and we get a trajectory for the new situation. That hopefully would be reasonable there. Of course, the question is how do you generalize? Let's say you registered training points on the test points, your function f, has to get those registrations correct, but then there are infinitely many functions that will do that. So which one of the infinitely many functions are you gonna pick as your generalization from the registration points to the entire 3D space? So here's one choice that we've been going with. So you say you pick the function that minimizes the sum of the squares of its second derivatives integrated over the entire space. What's nice about that is that, well, if it's just translation, rotation, and scaling, second derivatives are zero. So you favor these simple transformations over other more complicated transformations. In some sense, you're measuring how close you are to an affine transformation, and you find the closest to affine transformation that does the registration and gives you an extrapolation for the entire space. It also turns out that you can solve this very efficiently, as efficiently as a least squares problem. Even though it's a search over, in principle, all functions, it can be shown that you can solve this by restricting yourself to considering a weighted combination of basis functions and solve a finite dimensional optimization problem. So let's take a look at how this works. So here what we have is before the video started, a student already demonstrated how to tie a knot, then now it's the robot's turn to tie the knot. In the top right, what you see in action is the warping. You see how a warping is computed that warps the layout of the rope at demonstration time onto the layout of the rope at the current time, then the extrapolation of that registration is used to generate the trajectory for the gripper of the robot, sometimes both grippers. That's then executed, and this gets repeated. And so in this case, we have a square knot tied, learn to tie from just one demonstration. Rope is one specific case where it's very interesting to apply this technique because the, a rope can appear in many, many different configurations, but you can also apply this to other um, objects, maybe clothing articles that you like to fold, um, rigid objects, where now the registration effectively morphs a rigid object of one shape into a rigid object of a different shape, and you adapt to grasp and approach, and even bottle caps and so forth. Okay, let's take a quick look at the reinforcement learning story. Um, I'm going to uh, start with an inspiration here, which is an extreme caricature of the recent history of computer vision. So all computer vision folks, close your eyes. This is not exactly accurate. But here is state-of-the-art computer vision until 2012. Okay. So you have an Im input image. You have some hand-engineered features, let's say, Sift, Hog, Daisy, which are very carefully chosen, computed from your image. 
That gets fed into a support vector machine that was trained to be really good at using those features to then predict whether there's a dog, a cat, a car, or a person in the image. Um, and this worked okay, but not all that well. Then 2012, things changed really. It's been 10 years in the coming, people working on this, but 2012 was the landmark paper that kind of showed there's a different way of doing this that actually works better. Different ways that the whole middle part you replace by one big machine learning box happens to be an eight layer neural net with 60 million parameters. Um, that's not the only part you need. You need lots and lots of labeled images and then lots of lots of computational cycles to train those parameters to be right to do this task. But the bottom line here is that somehow with enough data, with enough computation, and 10 years of people thinking about what that box in the middle should be and how you optimize it, you actually end up with something that's more powerful than what we had before. And the question is, can we do something similar for reinforcement learning? Where maybe we can learn control policies with lots of parameters rather than just a small number of parameters. Um, so here's what we want. We want a neural net, let's say, or something similar to map from inputs to outputs and perform a task. If you look at standard policy search methods, they only scale up to a small number of parameters. Why doesn't it just work like it worked in computer vision? The difference is that in computer vision, for every image, you have some label that says, this is what you're supposed to predict. In control, you don't get that. You can run a controller, see what happens, but it's a whole evolution over time. It's not information about this is what you do right now. So here's a way to work around that. It's called guided policy search. What you do there is you say, let's first find good solutions to the problem, but very specific instantiations of the problem. So one problem at a time. When you solve one specific problem, you use it as supervision to your neural net to then train the parameters of the neural net to agree with what you just found. And of course, you do motion planning or trajectory optimization for many, many, many thousands, hopefully, of instantiations, and then feed them in there to train the parameters. So here's how this could work. So here is the robot being trained to place a block, in fact, nicely stack it. And this is the trajectory optimization for a single task. This is sped up by a factor 20. This takes about 10 minutes total for the robot to learn completely from scratch to place that block and it needs to feel out the context to really shift it in place. Once it's trained, this is one training session. We do this multiple times. We train, in this case, for four targets, the red locations, and then try to generalize to the green locations, which are different locations. And so what you see here is the learned neural net controller learned from these single trajectories that supervise it um, to then generalize to a new location and it has learned a policy that understands to push against the block, shift around until it feels it gives away a little bit, and then push in. Um, you can do something similar for walking. Um, I'm going to skip over that here. What I want to say is that there are still many directions to be tackled here. This was just a specific task still. Um, big open questions are, how do you learn across different tasks, maybe a single representation that generalizes? Um, computer vision, you don't learn one thing for car, another thing for dog, and another thing for Maybe cat, you learn it all at once. This is all learned on one task only, so it's very different still. Um, how to use perceptual input directly. Could you just feed in images and from that generate controls? A reasonable starting point might be computer games. And so what you see here is four different neural nets that were trained on four different computer games, each of them having 35,000 parameters. And so we learned from scratch just from the pixels, what the right actions are, at least reasonable actions, to do reasonably well at these games and extremely well at Palm. <laughs> All right, thank you. It seems like the examples you showed which worked very well are ones which had continuous three-dimensionality built into them sort of from the ground up. And the ones that everybody makes fun of about learning cats from seven million examples are the ones which didn't have three-dimensionality in. Does this sound like a reasonable distinction to you? Um, not, not sure that that's, that's the distinction here. So there are, there are two parts to it. I would say 
One part is what space are you working in? And so, for example, for the control problems where you work directly on the state, your trajectory can gradually get better and so you can move closer so you have some shaping of the objective that you're doing better. Um, you could argue that in the cat example, the, re the way you shift closer gradually rather than all of a sudden needing to get everything right is by having thousands and thousands of cat images. And in that sense, you're like getting now one, images right, one image right, the second one right, and that's in some sense fairly similar in how you would shift closer and closer to get things right. I would say the biggest distinction is that for the control problems, there's the temporal aspect. And so that, that gives you two, two additional challenges. One of them is that you don't get direct supervision, you only get at the end, did you do well or not well? The other part is that for the image classification learning, somebody tells you these are the images or the distribution of images you need to work on, learn something that does well, whereas for control, you have to explore the space yourself. So you actually, if you're pro controlling yourself really poorly, then you might never visit the part of the space where you really need to be. So there's an exploration process at the very beginning there that you also need to figure out before you can even learn something is good. All right, let's thank Peter again.